Full B minus. Yay. <laughs> and we She's trying to make her. <laughs> She's trying to make us. <laughs> Protein and associated tasks. Um, 
was left at the promoter. Well, um, the RNA P polymerase. And this basically allows for um, additional recruitment of polymerases. They can actually be transcribing the same gene again by many different polymerases at the same time. Instead, termination um, requires transcript processing, which is going to be the major topic for today, is what sorts of processing occurs. But before we do that, um, remember I said that there were additional The silencer sequences, again, those can occur in different places, so um, it might be upstream of transcription initiation, it might be downstream of transcription initiation, it might overlap it, so it can be in lots of different locations, um, although usually when we talk about silencer regions of DNA, we are considering it to be kind of part of the promoter sequence, and then promoters could be downstream, upstream, overlap initiation sites. But so it's not a separate DNA strand that we're talking no, it's going to be somewhere upstream of your gene or possibly downstream of your gene. Okay. But it is a sequence of DNA close to your gene that the repressor protein comes and binds to, and that stops transcription. And there are different reasons that might happen. We're going to talk about one in the next chapter. Okay. Or maybe the chapter after that. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> um, activators. So you can probably guess what these are. These are um, proteins that bind to an enhancer DNA sequence to upregulate. And so then an enhancer region is the same idea <coughs> as the silencer region. It's, it's something that is part of our promoter sequence. So it could be upstream, could be downstream, could overlap um, our initiation site. Uh, that 
guess we caught up to where we were supposed to be yesterday. So now we're going to talk about post transcriptional processing. Processing happens for ribosomal RNAs and for transfer RNAs, but we're not really going to talk much about that. <laughs> Mostly we're just going to talk about messenger RNAs. So this is going to include addition of a 5 prime. of a 3 prime poly A tail. Splicing of exons to remove introns. And editing. Um, and an example of that might be methylation. Actually, causes the substitution. Okay, so before a messenger RNA is ready to be sent to the cytosol and get translated into a protein, you've got to do all this. this Post-transcription processing. Sorry, with that card cap. Seven methyl guanosine. It's linked five prime two five prime. <coughs> they try to state bridge. Translation um, start site. And just a reminder that everything we're talking about is in curious. This is completely different. Focus. Why is it so specific as to 30 nucleotides? That's right, do you know? Um, no, but my guess would be. Um, that if we've got these big kind of enzyme complexes that have to do these reactions, that you probably just need clearance of the polymerase to let other things get in. Better 
messenger RNA. So, you know, in between all our nucleotides, you have one phosphate in your bridge, in the phosphodiester bridge. Um, but the very first nucleotide still has all three of its phosphates. And so you have something that looks like, looks like that. Where this is, is this kind of your five prime and then your messenger RNA with the three phosphates on it. So your triphosphatase is going to break off one of those phosphates and just move two. And then releases an inorganic. to 5 prime, and so that makes a, a, a G linked through three phosphates to the rest of the messenger RNA. And then that releases a pyrophosphate. Additional methylations that may or may not be there. So additional methylations may include um, the first base of the messenger RNA. So not the one seen which just got attached, but the very first base was there. Um, or In our homework, it talks about the methylation happening at the end at the estrogen mm -hmm. instead of the oxygen, and I have a hard time visualizing how that happens. <laughs> so it just depends on what it's attached to. Okay. So, so the when I say base, it's attached to the base. It's attached to a nitrogen in the ring. So okay. overall, our A's, G's, C's, and P's are nitrogenous bases. Okay. Yeah. yeah fair enough. The picture is here. nitrogen on the G ring that has the methyl group attached. Um, and then, so then there's maybe, and these are in parentheses because it may be, uh, this doesn't always happen, but you can get methyl groups on uh, that first base of the messenger RNA. Um, and then it can happen to some two primary dorsal positions in the messenger RNA as well. Okay, 
So how would you classify the RNA triphosphatase? about 250 nucleotide A's that are added to the three prime end of the transcript. And then your transcript tail, which should be poly A, poly A tail, steps. Oh, 
question just about messenger RNA in general. Is one strand of messenger RNA what codes for one entire protein? No, not necessarily. One gene codes for one protein. Um, in eukaryotes, it's, it's a little different. It's more likely that you will have um, kind of one gene, one transcript, one protein. Uh, but in bacteria, they make super long messenger RNAs all the time, so there are multiple genes in that messenger RNA. They all have their own translation start sites, um, so it's kind of multitasking that way. Yeah. Uh, so no, it, it isn't always one, one gene, one transcript. So transcript is cleaved um, approximately 15 to 25 nucleotides downstream from um, a conserved, although it's kind of semi-conserved, but it's not always easy to spot this, AAUAA sequence. And less than 50 nucleotides upstream of a U or GU rich region. So, what this means is that as you're transcribing, the polymerase is just going along its merry way of transcribing, um, and it might keep going after the transcript's already been cleaved um, from it. So, Oh, I don't know if I can do it with the picture like that. So you've got your DNA, and you've got your RNA polymerase, and you've got your, your messenger RNA that it's making. somewhere downstream from the A, A, U, A, A, and upstream from this G, U, rich region. Um, but the polymerase might just keep going. So it's not quite termination of transcription that defines the end of my messenger RNA. It's this cleavage event that determines the end instead. Um, eventually, the polymerase will, will just fall off. But, um, it's not as clean cut a signaling event as it is in prokaryotes. So we cut it, and then we get this polymerase, called poly A polymerase. Or PAP. Um, and that adds the three prime poly A tail. And the nifty thing about this polymerase is that it does not require a template. template. C, um, P, S, F. Okay, and these are accessory proteins. And these are needed um, to identify the cleavage site.
Processing that. Splicing of introns. Um, you splice together exons, you splice out introns. So an intron is an intervening. Non-expressed meaning that it is not a gene that's going to code for a protein. And an exon is an expressed sequence. So these are our genes, these will code for proteins, or they might code for chromosomal RNAs or transplant DNAs. Splicing can occur while a transcript is still being transcribed. Basically, your exons are spliced together, and your introns are removed. Okay, so when you look at a messenger RNA in eukaryotes, there's usually quite a bit of sequence that's not part of the final messenger RNA molecule. Um, so it, it, this is another electron micrograph, and so it's little, so it's hard to see. But there are these loops in the messenger RNA, and these are all places we are where we are in the process of splicing um, out introns. Um, so what's in red here is kind of showing what the final messenger RNA sequence consists of, um, and all these loops are introns that are being spliced out, and so they're not part of the final message RNA. Okay. So that means so it's like there's way more introns than extron. Yeah. Ex are there more? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. We have just as much intron as exon. I actually don't know what the exact percentage is, but um, okay. So we're going to talk about this in a bit. But this is, this is your junk DNA, right? Okay. And everyone's heard of junk DNA? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That isn't really junk because it actually serves some purposes, um, but we don't necessarily understand all the purposes. Um, but there's all these intervening sequences that don't code for proteins, and they're messing up our messenger RNAs, and they all have to be spliced out. And there's this complicated system that has arisen to make that happen. Um, but yes, there is a huge percentage of our genome that is this extra sequence. Mm -hmm. actually the same um, transcript that they were showing in the picture for this overall um, So for the whole gene like 7,700 base pairs, um, but then we're down to 1,800 or some uh, nucleotides in our final transcript. And so then all those, that's in yellow and all those introns that got removed. Can you scoot it up? Oh, yep. Dr. O, when you say conserved, does that just mean 
It means that that sequence is always the same, or almost always the same, no matter what gene you're looking at, or sometimes. So sometimes we talk about being discerned between genes, but um, but also between organisms. Okay. So you see the same sequence every time. It's discerned. So this is going to be an invariant. GU at intron 5 prime n. And it's going to be an invariant AG at the intron 3 prime n. And splicing occurs in two steps. It's just some transesterification reactions. So any kind of transesterification reaction is a nucleophilic acetyl substitution. You've seen those many, many, many times, right? And that's all they are. Um, so my nucleophile, you gotta ask what the nucleophile was, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, although it was with the self-splicing, for example, what they were doing. But it's, it's still gonna be a hydroxyl group. Transesterification, where the two prime hydroxyl, which is normally not tied up, because remember it's there are three prime that's involved in all my phosphodiester bonds in, in my RNA, but the two prime hydroxyl um, of an adenosine um, within the intron usually thelically attacks. Five prime phosphate at the splice junction. And that's going to cause the five prime exon. going to cause formation of the lariat structure. That's the lariat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lasso. Mm -hmm. Splice junctions. So I have an exon on the five prime end of my intron. I have an exon on my three prime end of the intron. Um, and then my splice junction um, again are these these conserved residues. So there's the GU that's at the five prime end of the intron. And there's the AG at the three prime end of the intron. And that is a 100 because that is strictly conserved. Um, the uh, a that's going to do the nucleophilic attack is going to be somewhere in the middle of the sequence, and it will also be embedded in something that is conserved, but it won't be as strictly conserved. Okay, so um, there's my little two-prime hydroxyl that's coming from my A in the middle of my intron, and so it nucleophilically attacks the phosphate bridge between my intron and my exon. Um, my leaving group then is the exon end. Uh, and what I end up is actually linking this hydroxyl group to that G in my um, <coughs> intron, and it makes a little cyclic structure. So that's my lariat, looks like lasso. And that's the first step is forming that loop. Okay, but now I gotta attach these two together. So I'll write this up a bit, but then um, the second step is just another transesterification reaction. We're now going three prime hydroxyl that was freed up from my first exon is going to nucleophilically attack the bridge at the other splice junction. Mm. Okay. And now my leaving group is the intron, is the lariat. So that leaves, and I've now joined my two exons together. Okay, so let me write that one down. Okay, step two. Transesterification. Where um, the 
recently formed 3 prime hydroxyl um, of the released exon nucleophilically attacks phosphate at And the three prime 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 that, that gets confusing after a bit because if you're if you're talking about where you're cutting, the first cut happens at the five prime end of the intron, but the three prime end of the exon, um, and then the second cut you make happens at the three prime end of the intron, but the five prime end of the exon. <coughs> so it's, it's, you have to be careful with those. It's easy to swap. So this joins the exons together. And there yet, leaves. And this is my intron that I just spliced up. requires some additional things. So it's going to require um, some X onic <laughs> sequence enhancers to um, help define splice site. So it isn't just the junction sequence. Because you know, if you went into your DNA and just look for a GU, you're going to find GUs all over the place. So it's, it's not just that it's a GU. Um, it's that it's a GU that's always um, in a position relative to other sequences that are in both your intron and your exon as well. Um, so there are going to be more sequences that are going to start to make this happen. Um, these are called ESEs, and they are hard to identify. Um, predicting splicing patterns is not always easy to do. Um, also, it's going to require um, an enzyme catalysis. by the spliceosome. And this is a large Could you move it up? 45 S, 45 Spedbergs. So it contains some RNAs that we haven't talked about yet. Um, it has uh, small nuclear RNAs. Uh, and then it has a bunch of proteins called SNRPs. <laughs> uses proximity and orientation to catalyze splicing. As, as you saw, all the group 
groups involved in the actual reactions are part of my introns and exons. Um, and so the splice zone is really just needed to bring those groups together in space to make it happen. Um, it also uses some metal ion catalysis to help improve nucleophile strength. So you have a hydroxyl acting as your nucleophile. Um, if you have a way to make that hydroxyl more acidic, you can make it um, a better nucleophile. Um, and so that's done by the process. Um, there's a huge section just about the spliceosome in your book. We don't have time to go over the structure in detail, but it's kind of impressive looking. Um, uh, you got this ring structure um, that's made up of a bunch of scripts. Um, <laughs> and then you've got these, these RNAs. So mm. there's this one, a small um, nuclear RNA. Um, and those RNAs are needed to help actually base pair with your transcript in certain regions just to get everything positioned so that that 2 carbon hydroxyl is ready to attack that bridge. Okay, so it's all positioned in orientation. So this seems like a lot of trouble. Um, so roll for splicing. Why not just have the genes the way they're supposed to be, like they do in bacteria? <laughs> So one gene can code for more than one protein. Okay, so this actually does make sense because then we, we have a way of um, um, saving space in our genome by having one gene code for lots of different proteins that might have slightly different functions. Um, and this is often seen um, in tissue specific proteins. Okay. So the, the image from your book is for, um, uh, oh, is it tropomycin? I actually didn't write that. I didn't grab the figure legend, so I think it's tropomycin, um, which is something you're going to find in muscles. But you've got lots of different muscles in your body. Um, and so the splicing pattern will actually differ for it depending on, on what that tissue is doing. So if you've got striated muscles versus smooth muscles, they don't work exactly the same. Um, and it, in this particular gene is spliced in a different pattern um, to give that slightly different function. Um, so all the grays are introns that are being removed, and they're removed everywhere, but every once in a while, what happens, um, so if we take this for example, here's a region that shows up in smooth muscle um, that is not in my striated muscle. Um, in striated muscle, it gets spliced out, so it gets spliced out with this intron and that intron, and it just makes one big loop between those exons, um, whereas in the smooth muscle, it cuts out those two little introns separately, um, and it leaves behind that region. So, you know, this way we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different tissues with seven different proteins that all came from the same gene. Okay, so that, that's the rule that kind of makes sense and is easier to understand. Um, but the other possibility, when people talk about what is the purpose of all this junk DNA that we have, um, is that it may be an agent for rapid evolution. Um, so, unfortunately, we haven't talked about DNA replication, and we haven't talked about recombination, but um, when recombination happens, you get shuffling of um, 
DNA sequences between uh, chromosomes, right? And so there's always this possibility that depending on where it recombined, you could put new intron sequences together with actual exon sequences that could turn into a new exon with brand new function. Um, and so it's, it's thought that we need all this extra sequence information to increase our chances of um, evolving over time proteins with new functions. Processing your messenger RNA after the fact. So, um, and I'm just going to write down one example here. Um, if you deaminate, which means remove an amino group, a C, it makes a U, and we just turned our C into a U in our sequence. Yes. So, if you're looking at codons, for example, um, a CAA would normally code for a glutamate. But if you change um, the C and turn it into a UAA, that is a stop codon. So yeah, those two sequences are going to come out very different. Um, one is going to be truncated um, relative to the original transcript. And that could be used to prevent a gene. It might be like a regulation event where we want to prevent this transcript from being expressed. And so rather than doing it at the genetic level, you do it at the transcriptional level instead. Um, oh, why do I keep doing that